How about you? Yeah, you. Each and every one of you. How are you doing in your relationships? For we all know that we as human beings, we are hardwired, we are created, we are made to be in relationships. Indeed, that's the essence of what it means to be human. The quality of life that we have is going to be directly tied to those relationships. Relationships are important. Relationships we have with God, with ourselves, with our family, with others. That's what this four-week chapel series is about. That is what today's worship service is about. It's about you. Today, we focus on relationships to God, God's relationship to each and every one of us gathered here. My job is to preach. Your job is to listen, to hear the Word of God to you through me. It may come in a whisper, it may come in a shout, but I can assure you that if you will but listen, God will speak. And I come today not as a senior vice president for student affairs or a professor of religion who's been teaching students here now for 30 years. I come as a fellow human being, a traveler on life's road, a fellow believer along many of you in our Lord Jesus Christ. I come sharing out of my own journey, my own wrestling with the question of how do I best relate to God? How do I get that relationship? How do we get that relationship, that most important relationship right? Because if you can get that relationship right and I can get that relationship right, then all the other relationships will fall more fully into their proper place. So I, at 62 years of age, come with a lot of wounds, a lot of ups and downs, But as one who has known the love of God in many, many ways, and out of my own journey, I've learned some things, and I've come to share some things with you about relating rightly to God out of that journey and out of Scripture. Three insights. The first one is this. And as well as we sang it and felt it just a few minutes ago, for some of us, this is the hardest one. To relate fully, properly to God. You need to ground your life in gratitude. Gratitude for what, you ask? Gratitude for yourself. Life properly lived before God is grounded in a sense of gratitude born out of the awe and the wonder of yourself. Think about that. I don't care if you're atheist and hate being here, agnostic and searching, or believer who at times struggles with depression or stress or anxiety. Think about this. Common sense tells us three things. You did not have to be at all. You did not have to exist at all. The 23 chromosomes pair, the thousands upon thousands of genes that make you, you, the one who there's never been another one like in all of creation, the one that there'll never be another one like, the totally, completely you did not have to exist. We all know how babies are made. And my biology professor friends tell me that when the sperm and the ovum came together, to form the conceptus that became you, that 280 days later was born and given life, there were more than another trillion other possibilities. And if any one of them would have made it, you would not be. You would not be. That's undeniable. But you are, and I am. I can see you. And you can see me. We have skin, we have breath, we have bones, we have eyes, we have life. We have it, every one of us, in us. You did not have to be, but you are. And the third thing is, you did not create yourself. You had nothing to do with creating yourself. Absolutely nothing. You're not self-made, self-created. Then why are you? Why do you have life? 
There are only a couple of valid options to that question. Are you merely a cosmic accident, happenstance? No. The Hebrew people, our Hebrew ancestors, would have us understand and have you understand that you are. Because God himself got personally, intimately involved in calling you out of nothing into being. Your life is gift. Not earned, not deserved, not created. Genesis 2 is your story and it is my story. If you want to relate rightly to God, then your understanding, your self-valuing, your self-worth has to be grounded not in what you think and what you feel of yourself. Because all of us some of the time and some of us all the time fluctuate with what we think of ourselves. No, our valuing of God is grounded in what God thinks of us. And Genesis 1 answers, Genesis 1, 2, and 3 asks, ask and answer some big questions, some big mysteries. Genesis 1, why anything rather than nothing? And it's this picture of this great God, this one, this almighty who did not have to create. He had all the power, all the options, created not because it had to, because he chose to. Born of the love of God is creation. And why me? Why you? Because that great grand God of Genesis chapter 1, that transcendent one, gets imminent, gets his hands dirty, and brings human out of humus. Brings Adam, humankind, out of Adamah, dust. Dust. Frederick Bigner says it this way. The grace of God means something like this. Here's your life. You might never have been, but you are because the party would have not been complete without you. Here is the world. Beautiful and terrible things will happen. Don't be afraid. I am with you. Nothing can separate us. It's for you I created the universe. I love you. There's only one catch. Like any other gift, the gift of grace can be yours only if you'll reach out and take it. But maybe being able to reach out and take it is a gift too. Fellow human beings here today, especially you collegians, hear this word. Your status is beloved. Beloved by God. Or else you would not be. You are because the one and only almighty, all-powerful, transcendent God got intimately involved in calling you into being. And you and I need to ground ourselves every day with a sense of awe and wonder for, and out of that gratitude. You did not have to be. I did not have to be. This day did not have to be. This is the day the Lord has made. And we ought to take joy in that. It was when I was a collegian that I was introduced to a writer named John Claypool and a theological insight that he provided that has changed me ever since. He says this, life is gift and only when it's accepted with omen arms of gratitude can it be everything which God intends for it to be. You, my friends, are beloved by God. Your life is gift. To relate properly to God then you must begin by grounding your life in gratitude to God for the beloved miracle, the unique beloved miracle that you are. That's the good news.
But the new, good news gets even better. That's the message of the passage in Romans. It moves me to a second point. That to relate properly to God, you must grant Jesus Christ his rightful place as Lord. Your status and my status as beloved of God did not end with our being born and being brought into this world and given the gift of life. Indeed, it only began there. But to hear the good news, we also have to hear the bad news first. And the bad news is that you and I, just like every Adam and Eve and every man and woman since, we have failed to live up to our calling of what God has called us to. Genesis 3 is about why sin, and it's pretty simple. The man and the woman depicted there, they refused to believe God's good word about them. That as they were where they were, with no changes whatsoever, they were the crowning point of creation. They were the ones who reflected his image. But they can then... No. So they refused to believe that great truth. And so what did they do? They went chasing after that which was pleasing to the eye, that which was sensually satisfying, that which they thought would make them wise. The Bible calls it the fall. It calls it the sin. It is their story. It is our story. We have missed the mark. We have failed. We have fallen short of the glory of God, which he created us as his beloved. We know what shame feels like. I certainly do, and I know you do too. We know what guilt feels like. At times we feel guilty, have a guilty conscience because we are simply guilty. Although human, we have tried to be our own God. We wanted to be creator. And we have, doing so, have made ourselves estranged from God. And yet, yet, the God who created you, who called you from nothingness into being, and who granted you the status of his beloved, loved you so much that that divine one took on flesh, became incarnate in Jesus of Nazareth, and as today's passage said, God commended his love toward us in that while we yet were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Try this on for size. On the one hand, no matter how hard you try, no matter how hard you try, you cannot make God love you any more than God already does. Jesus Christ is proof of that. It was for you that he sent Christ into this world. As Paul says, we are saved by his life. We are saved by his death. We are saved by his resurrection. It was for you that God commended his love. Elsewhere, Paul calls Christ the very stamp of God's being, the one in whom all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell, the one through whom all things were created and in whom all things are held together. It is through Christ that we have been reconciled. So on the one hand... Beloved of God, no matter how hard you try, you cannot make God love you any more than God already loves you. And Christ is proof of that. But try this on. On the other hand, no matter how much you deny it, you cannot make God love you any less. God loves you so much that Christ died for you, period. Case closed. You don't get to vote. All you've got to do is ask yourself the question, will you accept your status as the beloved of Christ, the one for whom he died Will you be reconciled to God or not? And there's another one for which you don't have a vote. 
In Philippians chapter 2, Paul says this of Christ. He sings to him, who though he was in the form of God, didn't regard equality with God as something to be exploited, but emptied himself, taking the form of a slave, being born in human likeness, and being found in human form, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even death on the cross. Therefore God also highly exalted him and gave him the name that's above every name, so that the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven, on earth, and underneath the earth, and every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. The Greek word translated should there is imperative in tone and mood. It implies that there will come a time where every knee will bow, heaven and earth and underneath the earth, that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. That's not being put up for a vote. Every tongue will confess. The only choice that you've got is When? When? Why not now? I would implore you to to grant Jesus Christ his rightful place as Lord over your life now so that you may have the life, the life abundantly. Gain salvation in Christ. It's not about evacuation. It's not about what am I going to do when I die. It's not about fire insurance. Salvation in Christ, the Lordship of Christ, is about transformation. It is about here now. It is about being transformed into a relationship of intimacy with God so that beginning right now, we can have what John calls eternal life in another place called life abundantly. And so if we are to relate ourselves rightly to God, we've got not only to ground ourselves in gratitude out of awe and wonder for who we are, but we also have to Grant Christ his rightful place as Lord. The third thing is once we've done that, and if and only if we've done that, can we go live life out of the divine center of the resurrected Christ in us? Hear the words of the Apostle Paul again. I pray that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give you a spirit of wisdom and revelation as you continue to come to know him, so that with the eyes of your heart enlightened, you may know what is the hope to which he has called you, what are the riches of his glorious inheritance among the saints, and what is the immeasurable greatness of his power for us who believe. According to the working of his great power, God put this power to work in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at the right hand in the heavenly places. Far above all rule and authority and power and dominion above every name that's named, not only in this age, but in the age to come. Did you hear that? Did you hear that? My life forever changed sophomore year in high school. Like many of you, I was born and raised by a Christian family, born in the church, professed faith that Christ was baptized when I was nine. From 9 to 15, I had enough religion to bug me but not bless me. At 15, because of a job change, my father moved me from the only place that I knew, Central Arkansas, to the mid-Texas Gulf Coast. It was absolutely the most traumatizing, dark night, pure hell. I won't go into it in detail, but it was bad, gang. It was really, really bad. Never, ever have I experienced... despair like that even as a believer but through the auspices of a man named young tucker who had a two-minute conversation with me in october asking me how tall i was 
what did I weigh? What position did I play? And he said, I have a son like you. Found out six months later, or about five months later, that through the auspices of Young, he had a real dynamic relationship with Christ as present tense. His son named Danny, Young had moved him the year before, moved him from Lubbock to Dallas the year before me. Danny and I's lives paralleled each other very much. Young came home one day and found Danny, who had committed suicide by hanging. Six months later, because of his relationship with Christ, young Tucker spoke hope and life into me. And here's the change. He had something that I did not have, but I learned, and it's simply this. He had a relationship with Jesus Christ that was present tense. Christ in him. And did you hear this, believer? That if you be in Christ, the same power through which God raised him from the dead, that power resides in us. So we can we can ground our lives in gratitude toward God. We can grant Jesus Christ his rightful place as Lord over our lives, but we can go knowing that we have a divine center. The resurrected Christ, the Holy Spirit of God resides in us. And out of that divine center and its ever transforming power, We can both be transformed inwardly and we can transform everything we touch. So how do we relate properly to God? Ground your life out of a sense of awe and wonder and gratitude over the miraculous beloved gift that you are. Grant Jesus Christ, his rightful place is Lord. You do not make him Lord. He is Lord. You merely accept the reality and live into that reality by acknowledging it now. And then go live out of the divine center of Christ in you. And what if you ain't got that? What if you don't have it and you want it? It's pretty simple. There's a word called repent. All it means is turn. It can mean turn in action. It can mean turn in attitude. It takes two things. Humility and trust. Humility to admit that you cannot find your own way, the own direction... And trust that if you will but turn to that power, God can do that for you. How about you? How about you? You don't have a choice of whether or not you're beloved. And you don't have a choice over whether or not he is Lord. You merely got the choice. Will you accept it, claim it, live out of it? That is how we relate properly to God. Let us pray. Oh, beloved Christ. Help us to believe the truth about ourselves, no matter how beautiful it is. Lord, I pray that if there be anybody in here 
who has not heard that word, beloved, who has not accepted you as their Lord and Savior, that somehow, some way, they'll be led to seek one of us out. And Lord, I pray for my brothers and sisters in this room who, yeah, we've done that, but we may not have lived out of the reality of you alive and well living in us and through us. Oh, beloved Christ, help us to believe the truth about ourselves and the truth about you. And may our believing make all the difference in the world. For your kingdom's sake, for our own sake, we ask and pray. Amen.